Welcome to the NWADC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and we're privileged to have Dr. Joanne Steckler with us. D Dr. Steckler is an assistant professor of medicine and deputy director of Seattle King County HIV STD program, and she's going to give a talk today on primary HIV infection. Welcome, Dr. Steckler. Thank you very much. So the four things I'm going to want you to get out of the next 15 minutes are understanding what primary infection is, why it's important to recognize, how to recognize it, how to test for it, and some issues that are specific to treatment of primary infection. So before I go any further, what is primary HIV infection? We typically say it's the period when people first are diagnosed with HIV from the point of HIV acquisition until some arbitrary point about six months later. It gets divided into two periods of time, acute and early HIV infection. Acute infection is the period of time from acquisition until antibodies are detected, and early infection is from antibody development to, again, this arbitrary point about six months later when the immune system is mature. So I am going to interchange, and I apologize, between talking about primary HIV infection and really, really focusing on acute HIV infection. So again, the, the period of time when people are, are first um, uh, infected. And so why is primary infection important? Well. There are a few reasons. One of the main reasons why we think it's important is because people who are uh, recently infected are very likely to transmit for sex act. And this is partially due to the fact that viral loads when people are first infected can be very high in the 1 million, 10 million, 100 million range. But there's something else that is specific about um, recent infection that in a virus that's been just transmitted from somebody else, it's probably more likely to be transmitted on. And so even when you control for viral load, there's probably a tenfold increase in transmission per sex act <clears throat> among people who have been recently infected. But then people say, you know, how important is it really when primary infection is really this very short period of time compared to the decades that people may be infected? And what comes up is this question of um, how, how important is it in terms of all transmission that's going on? And this is what I call the magic question because it's really an unanswerable question because it really depends on your epidemic. And the slide that I'm showing you here is another slide um, figure from a nice review that was done about acute HIV infection by Mike Cohen and UNC and published last year in the New England Journal, looking at all of the studies that have tried to answer this question of what proportion of all new infections come from other people who have also been recently infected. And you can see there's a relatively wide range um, of estimates, but overall what I tend to say is a sizable minority of all new infections will come from someone else who has also been recently infected. So trying to have an impact on all HIV incidents is one of the reasons why we think it's important to recognize these people with acute infection. So again, people with acute infection, highly infectious, and even though it's a really short period of time compared to the entire time that someone's infected, it actually contributes disproportionately. There are other reasons why I think recognition of primary infection or acute infection is important. Um, for me, I work with virologists and immunologists who are trying to understand the immune system reactions that occur so that they can develop vaccines. But I think that there are also public health um, implications of recognizing people who have been recently infected. And this slide is just a nice illustration of that um, that was done in UNC by Lisa Hightow almost 10 years ago when their um, program to detect acute HIV identified a bunch of young black um, men who have sex with men, college students in different colleges across North Carolina. And by being able to identify that these kids had been recently infected, they did sort of upped their partner services and disease investigation, identified this cluster, were able to do targeted outreach and able to stop the cluster. So being able to identify recent infections has the potential to have public health impact as well. So now that I've hopefully convinced you that public, um, recognition of primary infection is important, I'm also going to tell you that it's really difficult. And there are a couple of reasons why it's difficult. The first is that although about half to nearly all people who acquire HIV will have at least one symptom um, of the acute retroviral syndrome in the first two weeks or so after getting infected, what you can see of this list is that the symptoms are really nonspecific. It's a fever, rash, sore throat, fatigue, viral-like illness. 
Um, and it's often not recognized, even though people will feel sick and may go into emergency rooms and other primary care providers, very few people get diagnosed with acute HIV the first time they see care. And a few years ago, we developed this education campaign that you can still look at. Um, it's the, you can find it at www.ru2hot, written as text, um, dot org. And it's a very simple website trying to give some basic information, but we tried to teach uh, HIV negative uh, men of sex with men here in Seattle the signs and symptoms so that they would specifically recognize the symptoms and go into a place where they could say, I need a specific test because I think I have uh, acute HIV infection. Because the, uh, before I get there, um, let me show you some pictures of um, the rash that may be associated. Again, it's this nonspecific macular papular rash. And um, people can also, in the lower right corner, I'm showing you a picture of thrush, because people with acute HIV infection can have very low CD4 counts, very high viral loads, and sometimes they'll present with um, oral candidiasis or even other opportunistic infections. We've seen people who drop their CD4 counts as low as sort of in the 50 range during acute HIV infection. Um, and then another illustration of sort of why it's difficult to diagnose. And I just love using this example. This is, if you've done board reviews, this is a board review example for you. It's a 21-year-old woman who's coming in with a three-week history of fever, fatigue, headache, sore throat. Um, she's got a, a rash. She's got some oral ulcerations. She's got swollen lymph nodes. Um, and uh, ha is diagnosed with gonorrhea. And because she has the fever and the headache, gets a spinal tap. Um, and you can see she's got too many white cells with a lymphocytic predominance, so looking like an aseptic meningitis. And I looked at this and I said, oh, that's you know acute HIV or primary HIV infection. Um, but the person whose board review I was borrowing said CMV, and I bring this up because this is one of our people who is an expert in primary HIV infection. And so even if the experts can't recognize what to me is clearly primary HIV, how can we expect people who don't see this all the time and really the goal of, um, sort of uh, my work is to try and educate both patients and providers so we can recognize what's a really difficult syndrome to recognize. So for me, when I think about primary HIV, I actually think about what else the differential includes because we see all of these other things much more commonly than acute HIV. But for you who may be seeing HIV negative um, folks for a variety of different reasons, I just want you to think if someone comes in with the flu or with um, what looks that could be syphilis or strep throat or any of these other compatible syndromes in the right clinical situation, I want you to think about primary HIV as well. And so I mentioned this, the other reason why it's difficult for providers is because of this issue of the window period. And so um, just to review with you, when people are um, first infected, it takes about one to two weeks for the viral RNA to um, get into local regional lymph nodes and then disseminate. And so you can actually detect uh, viral RNA in the blood starting at about 10 days. You get peak at about two weeks, but it's around this time when viral load peaks here in blue that people will have the maximum number of symptoms. That's when they're going to come in um, to your emergency rooms. But the problem is, is that shown here in red, is antibodies which don't become detectable for about three weeks using the best antibody test. And so there's this period of time, what we've called the window period for years, where people might have detectable RNA, they're coming in for symptoms, but their antibody tests might still be negative. And so as a provider, we have to know that if I'm suspecting primary HIV infection as the reason for a syndrome, we want to be doing tests that are able to detect it. And it's traditionally been uh, viral RNA that we've looked for. But what's really exciting is that um, we're starting to talk about P24 antigen testing. P24, uh, P24 antigen testing um, is looking for a viral, one of the viral proteins. Um, and it's in this line in purple. It's detectable. It's not quite as good as viral RNA. It appears probably three to five days after RNA can first be detected. And using our blood-based assays, it's usually about the time that viral loads are about the 15 to 30,000 range. So not as good as RNA, but still better than um, antibody testing. Again, probably by about a half a week. But what's really exciting, um, and it's a complicated slide that I'm showing you, is that our, our antibody testing, or the way that we're screening for HIV, continues to have gotten better. And so our first generation antibody tests were the ones 
we developed in the 80s. They were basically using a, a bunch of viral schmutz in order to detect um, the person's antibodies. And these had a window period of about four to six weeks. And over the last, what now, 25 years, our antibody tests have gotten better, our viral detection systems have gotten better, and so our antibody detection alone now has a window period of about three to four weeks. But again, what I'm really excited about is down here in this fourth generation an, um, assays, which combine both antibody testing and antigen testing. These are chemiluminescent immunoassays, so they're called CLIAs and not EIAs. But they work essentially in the same principle. And so you can get an antigen test, an antibody test in the same sort of automated system that gets your results back in a couple hours. And although it's not as good as RNA, will detect acute HIV infection. And, and two of these tests have been approved in the last couple of years, and we're starting to use them here at the university. Uh, Group Health is starting to use them, and I think other laboratories will start to use them over time. But one of the things that's really important for you to know in thinking about primary infection is you have to know what your lab is doing because we're in this place where I think most of the labs are still using um, this third generation antibody test, hopefully we've moved to third generation testing, but some are starting to use um, fourth generation. If you don't have a fourth generation test, you still want to use RNA if you're looking for acute HIV infection. Um, and this slide includes pooled RNA because here in Seattle we continue to do routine screening for men who have sex with men to see if we can detect acute HIV and we continue to do that. So if you diagnose someone who is antibody negative and either antigen or RNA positive, you're going to want to confirm that with another antibody test and then a Western blot, and probably four to six weeks later, just to be certain that that test is going to be positive. The way we test and diagnose um, and do case surveillance for HIV in the country is in the process of changing. So right now we're still at, in order to be a case, you need to be antibody in Western blot positive. Um, although I think in the right clinical situation, if you have someone with symptoms and detectable RNA or antigen in someone with risk, you're going to make that assumption that that's a true positive and go ahead and do all the other things that you would typically do for someone who is newly diagnosed with HIV, including screen them for other STDs, do your initial CD4 and viral load, and do baseline uh, genotyping. So, the question then comes, and um, this part of this talk used to be a much bigger part in terms of talking about the risks and benefits of treatment, specifically during um, acute or early HIV infection. And um, we know that if you treat someone at the time that they're sick, you can reduce their symptoms and make them feel better. And we've done that in settings where people um, I've seen people have such uh, sort of cerebellar inflammation that they couldn't walk. And treating that person with antiretrovirals will decrease the course of that, that disease. Um, you can obviously use antiretrovirals to decrease transmission. And then there's evidence that treating people uh, with antiretrovirals during acute infection can decrease the size of the latent pool of resting CD4 cells. But what you can see in the rest of this slide are all of the things that we've debated over the last 20 years about whether or not we should be treating people during primary infection. So if you start medicines during primary infection and then stop, can you reduce the viral set point and therefore decrease, sort of prolong the time that someone might not need antiretroviral therapy? Can you um, decrease viral dissemination? Can you decrease uh, viral mutation? Can you preserve immune function? But all of these are getting to the question of, can we change long-term outcomes by treating super early? And I think the reason why I'm sort of really short in this talk is that the environment that we're talking about for antiretroviral therapy is really changed because we're now recommending antiretroviral therapy, but we're basically everyone who's HIV infected. And so most people who have primary infection will fall into that greater than 500 category. And so it's really not sort of should I be starting specifically during primary infection, but does this person sort of, are they motivated? Are they in a place, situation where they're going to be able to take their meds? The same conversations you're going to have with that person about whether or not they should be uh, initiating antiretroviral therapy. Um, and so I will say that there probably is a relative urgency if you're thinking about starting in primary infection, but there's, there's not that same question. And these are the most recent recommendations from DHHS um, in terms of whether or not to start. You can see the top, they're saying treatment should be considered optional with a C3 recommendation, specifically during acute HIV. 
the IDSA guidelines actually recommend a little bit more strongly about treating during primary infection. But again, I think you're going to have a conversation with someone about whether or not they want to initiate early. But again, it's got to be very individual. I think what's really much more important and specific to primary infection is the second point here about what to start. Because um, the guidelines actually say use a ritonavir-boosted protease inhibitor. And some of these recommendations will probably change um, now that we have, obviously, lots of new antiretrovirals coming along. But essentially, the guidelines are to recommend a, not to use NNRTIs if you are going to start three, treatment during primary infection. And the reason for that is increasing drug resistance. And I'm just giving you an example from Seattle King County of what we're seeing in terms of transmitted drug resistance. So this is people who have never been on antiretroviral therapy before. These are people who are newly diagnosed with HIV and who are um, giving us specimens um, within, I believe, three months after their diagnosis. So it's not everybody who's newly infected, but this is giving us a snapshot. Um, and uh, the proportion includes um, high-level drug resistance, but also some polymorphisms that the CDC has asked us to monitor for. So these numbers are higher, really, than what you would see as having clinical impact. But in green, in this top line, is all drug resistance. And you could see that going up. Um, and we're over 20% of having some resistance, so conferring actual drug resistance and some polymorphisms. But what you can really see here clearly in this pink is this increasing NNRTI resistance, so non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor resistance. Um, and so we're saying almost all of the resistance that we're seeing is NNRTI, which basically, if you have it, um, will knock out a tripla. And I know a lot of us reach for a tripla as a first-line agent. And so if you are uh, thinking about treating someone during primary infection, number one, you want to send off that genotype, but don't wait to get those results. It's totally fine to start someone on a PI-based regimen and then change them to atripla or really sort of expand your options once you get that resistance testing back and have confirmed that the person doesn't have transmitted drug resistance. So just in summary, I hopefully um, convinced you that primary infection is a crucial time. It's important for us to recognize because people are really infectious and because overall primary infection accounts for a large large minority of overall transmission, but it's a real challenge. And so the symptoms are nonspecific, and you have to know what tests you're ordering. And I just ask you to think about it when you have that person coming in with a viral syndrome, if you're seeing folks who are HIV negative. Um, it's gotten a little bit easier since we're having those tests that can actually detect acute HIV without having to order a specific test, but you still have to think about ordering HIV tests. And then finally, if you're thinking about starting antiretrovirals during primary infection, please do so. Don't wait, but do avoid NNRTIs until you have those resistance tests back. Just a shout out for the primary infection clinic that we've been going on since 1992, have had several protocols, enrolled over 300 people with primary infection. And we're really available as a resource both to our patients and to you as providers. If you have questions, please feel free to contact us. So thank you.